and, and you can't really polymerize that and, and separate it out. So what we imagine is occurring, though, is that the gas is moving through the larger pores. The organic is spreading on the interface between the water and the, and the air. And the, the water surrounds the pores. They're water wetting. But we have some, perhaps some napple entrapped in the smaller pores that's not accessible to the gas. And also, we think we have sorbed material, which has to desorb and diffuse through the water to get out to the flowing gas. And that's what's creating this tailing and uh, rate-limited behavior that you see in those examples. Now, this is extremely important because that tailing is, again, higher than what you would be able to shut the blowers off and go home and say you cleaned up the aquifer. So we have to un try to understand this phenomenon. So in uh, summary, then, we've, we see mass transfer limitations in volatilization. They're not as severe, though, as they were with the dissolution, in the dissolution case. Um, they increase with decreasing mean grain size. Um, we saw little discernible reduction in the mass transfer coefficient with time, which means that you can use the same mass transfer coefficient to predict the whole uh, removal of NAPL process with, until the very, very end. But there is extended tailing, and we believe that that could be due to isolated NAPL as well as desorption uh, rate limitations and diffusion through the water, and we're still trying to sort that out. Okay, well, now I've given you a little bit about the unsaturated zone. Now I'm going to return to the saturated zone and talk about some work we've been doing to enhance the solubility of the organic. Now you'll notice here that the artist has changed, so I should explain. Um, this cartoon, um, the previous cartoons were done by a, um, a, a student in the School of Art and Architecture a number of years ago when I had a different talk to prepare. And I wanted to add to my uh, repertoire here and um, found out that the, the biomedical art department is charging quite a bit now for cartoons. So um, I turned to my trusty graduate students, as one always does as a professor, and found a frustrated artist among them. And uh, his name is Ernie Hahn. He's a, a master's student in our program, and he should get credit for this. I think that the devil looks a little bit like Popeye, but you get the, you get the idea. Um, what you want to notice here is that we no longer have inner tubes, but we have boats. And the boats are supposed to re represent the enhanced capacity for solubilization due to the presence of micelles. The work I'm presenting here was work conducted in a laboratory by Kurt Pinnell. Kurt came to me as a um, postdoc. He's a soil scientist. He got his uh, degree at University of Florida. Um, I got him a research scientist position, and we collaborated for about four years, but I couldn't keep hold on to him, and uh, he's now a professor at Georgia Tech, and that's test his hyperactive terrier. Okay, so um, those of you who may not be familiar with uh, micellar solubilization, what we're doing here is adding surfactants. We're creating aqueous solutions of surfactants to enhance the solubility or the apparent solubility of the organic. Now, we're choosing surfactants which have a low critical micelle concentration, which means we add a little bit of the surfactant, and it tends to form a micelle in water. And a micelle, in, in this case, is a structure which has a hydrophilic um, shell and a hydrophobic core. And the organic likes to preferentially partition into this core, so we can get a lot of organic solubilized in the system. And in fact, when you put in enough surfactant such that you get above the critical micelle concentration, the, the apparent solubility increases linearly with surfactant concentration. Now, this idea is not new at all. Uh, we steal most of our stuff from the oil industry, and we've stolen this from them. Um, in the oil industry, they've thought about using surfactants and have tested them in the laboratory and in field uh, demonstration studies to enhance the recovery of oil, a tertiary oil recovery. Now, in the petroleum industry, they've wanted to use extremely efficient solubilizers such that they lower the interfacial tension with the addition of the surfactant so much that they can actually mobilize the oil as a bank. Now, we were very concerned about mobilizing uh, napples, especially denapples. So we wanted to try to avoid that. And so instead, we wanted to focus on enhancing the solubilization without reducing interfacial tension a great deal. So from the oil industry perspective, we're using very inefficient surfactants. Uh, we're also choosing surfactants that tend to be uh, biodegradable and FDA approved because we think that there's going to be a regulatory issue with injection. 
So we're working with um, non-ionic surfactants that are components of cake mixes and drugs. And in fact, the results I'm going to show you here are for a, a sugar-based surfactant, a sorbitan-based surfactant. In fact, maybe the problem will be that it's too biodegradable and it won't get, we won't even get to the organic before the bugs eat it. But that remains to be seen. So um, the work I'm presenting here, we collaborated also with um, Gary Pope and Bill Wade at the University of Texas, Austin. Gary is in the petroleum engineering program there. And uh, his part of the project really focused on mobilization. And we focused, Kurt and I focused on solubilization. So I'm going to present the results of solubilization right now. Now, we wanted to build on the work that Susan Powers had done. Remember, she worked with dissolution in um, columns. So we wanted to look at solubilization in columns. We thought we could use the same sort of system and um, be able to, to extend her work very easily. Uh, we designed our columns longer this time. We're all the way up to 15 centimeters. Uh, what, what we have here is an entrapped dodecane in this column. Dodecane is a component of jet fuel. It's only soluble in water to about five parts per billion. Um, with this addition of the surfactant, we could enhance its solubility at this um, concentration to 3,500 milligrams per liter. So we're looking at a six order of magnitude enhancement in solubility, which is pretty remarkable. Now, I just said it's a component of jet fuel and all of that, but the real reason we used it was because we didn't have a fume hood in our laboratory, and I was not allowed to use a volatile napple at the time. So that's why we started with the dodecane, but it was an interesting study. The other thing we did is we made the column longer for a reason. We wanted to get equilibrium. We, we ran at a slow flow rate, and we designed our system so that it would be at equilibrium based on Sue Power's correlation. And the reason why is because we wanted to use an oil industry model, and the oil industry model was predicated on local equilibrium. Well, Kurt ran this experiment in the laboratory, and he was all ready for 3,500 milligrams per liter, but what came out was 500 milligrams per liter. So that was a surprise. And at first we were discouraged because that means that all the work that Susan did is not directly extendable to micellar solubilization. But maybe we were foolish to think that dissolution and micellar solubilization were the same thing. Now, clearly they're not. I now have a student uh, who's working on trying to sort out why the, the micellar solubilization process is much slower, try to get a mechanism for that. There's been very little work in that area. And it appears to be highly dependent on the organic structure as well as the surfactant structure. So it's not an easy problem. This is the most severe rate limitation that we observe. Anyway, Kurt took advantage of this opportunity. He uh, shut the column in for different periods of time. He had to shut it in for 100 hours before he reached equilibrium solubility. That's a long time. The other thing you will notice here, as you increase the velocity, it appears that the concentration is dropping a little bit. So there is some dependence on velocity, but not as severe as, as what Susan observed in her experiment. So if you compare, if you back out, if you assume that the mass transfer is still governed from that linear driving force expression and you back out a coefficient, what you find is the coefficient you back out for enhanced solubilization is two orders of magnitude smaller than what we saw for dissolution. Now, I'm not trying to discourage people because, look, we, we, we took a five part per billion soluble compound and made it soluble to 500 milligrams per liter. So we really enhanced its solubility. But what I'm saying here is we could not predict what we would see based on our batch measurements. We couldn't predict what we saw in the columns. So it needs to be taken into account, that's all. Um, now, how do you... How do you deal with this process? Well, I, I, I do want to show you it happens not just with dodecane. Now we have a fume hood in our laboratory. We're working with a D-napple, tetrachloroethylene here, and you see it happens again with tetrachloroethylene. The same surfactant will solubilize about 38,000 milligrams per liter of tetrachloroethylene in solution. Now, in uh, water, tetra, uh, um, PCE is soluble to, what, 150 milligrams per liter, something like that. So this is a uh, I think a three order of magnitude enhancement. So it's still very significant. We don't reach the solubility that we measure in the lab, but we get halfway there. So um, we have to shut the column in again for about, oh, 15 hours or so before we get to equilibrium. Now what you notice here too is the concentration's falling off. That's because we're cleaning up this column. We are uh, in about 15 pore volumes. We have removed about 90, or 98, 99% of that PCE. So it's doing the job. 
And it's dropping off in concentration because of that interfacial area phenomena we saw in Susan's work. Okay? So we, we're doing the job here. It's just not quite as quick as we might predict from batch study. Now, this is my only equation slide. I put this up to prove to you that we do use equations. Um, what, what, I ha what we try to do to model this process is um, we, we have to write an equation for the flow of water. And that's this equation right here. We do a mass balance on the napple. Now, the napple is assumed to be immobile. It's just sitting there solubilizing into the water. So the change in the napple uh, mass balance, the change in the napple mass is equal to the, to the solubilization. We use the linear driving force expression again to represent the solubilization. And what we did is we backed off the coefficient a couple orders of magnitude, but still assumed that we could represent it uh, in the same way that Susan had done. And then we have to write transport equations. We have to write a transport equ equation for the surfactant because the concentration of surfactant will dictate how soluble the or organic is in the water. And we have to write a transport equation, of course, for the organic because that's what we're interested in tracking. Uh, we also incorporated information on the sorption of the surfactant. Those of you who might be interested, the sorption of the surfactant is Langmuir. That means it reaches a, a sill and uh, it was not significant in these experiments. The losses were very, very minor, and it didn't really affect the results at all. Um, so we have uh, three coupled, uh, four coupled equations here that have to be solved iteratively. Um, the student that did this work is Tim Decker. You're going to see his paper in a minute, uh, his picture in a minute. Um, what I want to do is show you that this sort of model can fit the data. And this is actually a fit. It's really not a prediction, because we didn't have enough information to develop an independent correlation for that mass transfer. But you see the yellow line here represents the model simulation. And the red symbols represent the data. And it, this is just to say that this sort of modeling approach can capture the behavior that we saw in the column. Um, the neat thing about models is that you can predict things that you didn't measure. So what we did with this model now is we said, let's assume we've captured the basic phenomena here. And let's now use it to predict how long it would take to clean this column up, like a mini pump and treat operation. So Tim did a bunch of simulations. And what you see he represented it in this, pic in this uh, diagram are those simulations. What we have plotted is the time it took to remove all the napple versus the volume that we had to flush the column. Now, if you believe, again, in equilibrium, you would tell your client, flush the heck out of that column, because no matter what velocity you use, you'll never have to treat more volume. The only thing you'll do is reduce the time for cleanup. Now, that local equilibrium assumption line is represented here by the uh, pink straight line. So if you reduce uh, the um, increase of velocity, you just move down along this line. You decrease the time it takes to clean up, but you don't increase the volume. But our column did not behave in a local equilibrium fashion. So what we have instead is the red line. So as we increase the, the velocity, the pumping rate, we do decrease the time it takes to clean up the column, but we start to pay a price. And after some time, we're not decreasing the time very much, but we're really increasing the volume. Now, we didn't optimize this on a cost basis, but presumably you want to operate down in this region where you're kind of minimizing the time and minimizing the volume. Now, the other thing you can do with the model is you can try other strategies. So you know, everyone is looking at pulse pumping as a strategy for improving recoveries in mass transfer limited systems. So we thought we'd try it. So I had Tim shut the pumps off in the model and then start them back up again. And he shut them off for different periods of time. He came back with a couple points on this green curve. Now, you notice the green curve is above the red curve. That means that pulse pumping didn't work as well as continuous pumping. And I didn't believe him, poor Tim. So I sent him back. I said, do some more simulations. So he had to develop this whole curve for me. And then it finally started to think about it some more. And I realized the model was right. It's true. If you shut the pump down, you will reduce the amount of time it takes. Excuse me, you will reduce the volume, the cleanup volume required. However, if you allow me at the same flow rate to just reduce, instead of pumping at a high flow rate, to reduce the flow rate and pump continually, I'll always do better than you do by shutting the pumps off. In other words, continuous pumping at a slower rate is always better than stopping the pump. And uh, this conclusion was published in es and and it's been borne out by other studies that have been done in other rate-limited systems, like desorption and um, 
I think that was a system that was looked at. Um, Steve Gorelick and Charlie Harvey have looked at that at Stanford. Emil Friend has been looking at some of these systems. They've all come to the conclusion, based on numerical models again, and not real data, but it says that continuous pumping at a slower rate may be better than pulse pumping. So that's just for the uh, consultants in the audience to chew over. Um, OK, so with that, I'd like to move on to something else we discovered in the laboratory. Um, this was my view. You can see this is the earlier artist. Uh, this was my view of residual saturation a number of years ago. Water comes in and is trying to force the organic out, but he's wedged in there due to capillary forces, and he doesn't want to budge. Okay? Now, we designed our experiments very carefully so we would not make that organic budge. We didn't want him to budge, remember? We measured the interfacial tension with all our surfactant experiments, and we, we thought we knew what would happen. The first PCE experiment we ran, however, was not the one I showed you earlier. Instead, it was this one. We introduced the surfactant solution, and immediately, 13% of the PCE came right out the end of the column. It was mobilized. We didn't want to mobilize. We were alarmed. So I called Gary Pope up, and Gary says, oh, try it again. So we tried it again. It takes us a while. Same thing happens the second time. And we say, well, this is no fluke. Well, we forgot something. Then we started thinking, what did we forget? Well, we forgot about gravity. We forgot about buoyancy. We forgot about density. PCE is very dense. It has about 1.6 times the density of water. We're running our columns in a vertical orientation. So gravity is acting in the same direction as the flow. So what's happening is that the organic, the interfacial tension is being reduced such that the water can't even hold on to that organic. He just wants to rush right out because he's so dense. So what does this say? Well, we can't design our experiments using the traditional oil industry approach, which is just to look at the velocity of the water. This isn't tough. It just means that we have to rethink and retool. Okay? So the way you can analyze this is by using dimensionless numbers again. And again, we're borrowing from the oil industry here. A capillary number is a dimensionless quantity which relates the vis viscous forces, the force of the water flowing, to the capillary forces. That's what we designed our experiments with before. Then there's an also another number that has been defined, which is a ratio of the density effect, or the buoyancy force, to the capillary forces. Now, our contribution here is we scaled them so that they're additive, because we wanted them both to be on a macroscopic scale such that we could determine them for our system. Well, in our case, in the column, it's vertical, so they're summed together. In other words, the gravity force and the viscous forces are acting together in the same direction against the capillary forces. So Kurt says, oh, this is really cool. So now what we're going to do is we're going to get those super duper surfactants from Gary Pope. We don't care about toxicity right now. What we want to do is lower the interfacial tension and play around with this and see under what conditions we get mobilization. So we can try to develop some design tools. Now I just want to show you what happens if you mobilize. Now this is one of these super duper surfactants. We inject it from the top of the column here. And you can see that we're just flushing this clean. And it's, it's beautiful. If we could control it, it would be wonderful. Out in front of the, the front, you see it's sort of re-entraining. It's moving out as a bank, just like the oil industry tries to design things to do. And in about less than one pore volume, the PCE is gone. I mean, 99.9% .9 again. I mean, all the volume of PCE is gone. It's beautiful. So what Kurt did is he did a number of those experiments, and he varied the trapping number, which is the sum, was what we called that number, which is the sum of the capillary and the bond number. And he plotted the saturation of PCE versus trapping number. Now, to vary it, you have to use different surfactant formulations and different velocities. That's how you vary the trapping number. And what you see here is, if you keep the trapping number small, you won't mobilize. If you allow it to increase, you'll mobilize most of the PCE. So this curve, this is called a desaturation curve. It becomes a design tool. If you want to mobilize, you know what you have to do. And you have a, a curve like this for every sand you want to look at. So it's a, it's a very neat way to try to get at this effect. Now, the reason why we were concerned, though, is because the world is not one-dimensional. I don't have to convince you of that. Here's what happens when you turn that column on its side. So here, the surfactant solution is coming in. As soon as it contacts the PCE, it immediately drops down to the bottom. There is a bottom here course. But this is why we're concerned. We don't want to lose it in the field. 
Now, eventually, this stuff comes out because it's contained, but it sure doesn't come out in one pore volume. What's kind of neat now is if we decrease the permeability of the sand, we're decreasing the trapping number because that permeability is in the numerator. Look what happens. Isn't that neat? We get overriding, and you can almost predict this angle from the theory. So you get the surfactant coming in and overriding and the PC coming down. And eventually, this comes out also. Now, we've tried to model this quantitatively and so far haven't had a great deal of success. It's a very difficult thing to model. So we can predict the onset of mobilization, but we can't quantitatively predict the recovery at this point. We're not there yet. And I think it's because we're seeing rate limitations as well as uh, multi-phase flow effects. It's a very complicated system. Okay? So you can extend this trapping number idea to multiple dimensions, and we've done that. And you get a, a something that looks like this. It's not too bad. The trapping number is the sum of the square of the capillary numbers and the bond number and this other term which accounts for the direction of flow. And in the, in the horizontal, it's the square root of the sum of the squares. Now, lest you think life is this simple, I want to caution you that this is for an isotropic system. I don't want you to think that I believe in isotropy. Uh, I do it under laboratory conditions, but not under field conditions. Um, I did develop the equation for the anisotropic media, it did not get uh, into our ESNT paper, however, because the wisdom of the world says that shorter is better. So the, the editor and reviewers told us, take out the appendix. So uh, we have to put it somewhere else, and we, we shall. And we're trying, to, as I said, we're trying to be able to model this. But I just want to caution you, if you're going to use this to predict, you have to be careful, because this is for an isotropic medium. So, if, if we want to draw some conclusions from these surfactant flushing experiments, we found that surfactants can dramatically enhance the recovery of napples. Uh, we've observed rate-limited solubilization, so what we measure in the batch system doesn't translate directly to the column studies. We do see some rate limitations. Um, and perhaps most importantly, we've learned that density and buoyancy forces are extremely important when evaluating the potential for napple mobilization, and we think we have a tool that can allow us to evaluate this. But we need to, to do a little bit more work with this before we're completely confident. Now, if you'll bear with me just a bit longer, I want to try to put this together in a model. Um, I told you that I I'm a believer. I mean, maybe I haven't told you, but I'm telling you now. I'm a believer in models, obviously. I think that we, we can learn a lot from playing with them. Um, these phenomena are complex. And when they, there's a lot of feedback, you can, can't always predict what's going to happen. So it's very useful to put the phenomena that you've observed into the lab into a model and try to see what will happen. And it can save a lot of experiments, I believe. And field studies are so costly that I would like to do a number of field simulations before I'm ready to design a field experiment and go out there. Um, the work that I'm going to present here was, uh, uses a multi-phase flow sim simulator that was developed for EPRI originally. It's called MValor. We've modified it some. Klaus Rasfelder was a developer of that code. Klaus is a research scientist in my research group at Michigan and has been there for some time. He got his PhD at UCLA. Um, and the actual simulations I'm going to present here were conducted by Tim Decker. Tim just received his PhD this summer, and uh, he's now working at Camp Dresser McKee in um, Detroit. And Tim was also responsible for making all the picture slides for me. And you can see that his came out the sharpest and clearest. And he's also, actually he's gotten older. He's lost a little hair since this picture was taken. Anyway, um, I want to show you what Tim did with his PhD work. This has not yet been published, which we have a, a manuscript in draft at the moment. What you see here is kind of a pilot scale um, surfactant remediation experiment, okay? We're trying to incorporate reality now, guys, so we're not using homogeneous sands. Instead, we're allowing the permeability to be variable, as well as the capillary properties. Um, we're infiltrating uh, PCE. We're spilling 75 liters of PCE right up here. And this is a saturated aquifer. Uh, and we're allowing it to um, distribute itself as it would naturally. And then we're going to clean it up. And um, the properties for this aquifer were taken from um, the Borden site, because it has the, it's the most studied site, right? We also took uh, data from a site in uh, Switzerland, uh, Usel Formation, which is a sand and gravel aquifer. All the parameters that we used were, were, to the best degree that we could, were me laboratory measured parameters, okay? So we're trying to predict something that should happen or we think might happen based on laboratory measured results. So we discretized extremely finely at the lab scale, like on the order of five centimeters. So this is a costly simulation to run. 
Now, what Tim does is he creates realizations of this permeability field. The same statistical parameters, same variance, correlation length, average conductivity, but different um, local variations. And what you see here is just the kind of variability you would get in PCE entrapment. You release it in the same place, in the same statistical aquifer, and you can see that you do get a fair amount of variability. You can see it pooling up on a low permeability zone and kind of dribbling over. The light color is the highest saturation. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to isolate this one realization and I'm going to try to clean it up. We're going to inject the same surfactant we've been playing with in the left boundary and recover solution on the right boundary. And you're going to just see it uh, clean up. Now I presented this over, all over the country and occasionally people think this is real. It's wonderful what you can do with color graphics now, but this is not real. This is a numerical simulation and you, have to, you can't be, believe everything you predict. Okay? I'm sure you guys don't. But, um, okay, so we have surfactant coming in here from the left boundary, and you can see it hasn't reached the PCE yet, so it's pretty much intact. And this is the saturation of PCE, and then in the lower right, what you see is the concentration of PCE in the aqueous phase. Now, it's very low right now because it's just added solubility limit in water, which is about 150 milligrams per liter, which to you is a high value. But remember, we can enhance its solubility to something like 40,000 milligrams per liter with the surfactant coming in. Now, as the surfactant gets in contact with the PC, it starts to solubilize it away. And what you see here is that the concentration's really picking up in the aqueous solution. Now, it's about this time that I'm looking at results and I say to Tim, you know, 40,000 milligrams per liter, that's a lot of PCE. You think maybe we better put density into our model? Now, we're not mobilizing here, but we're solubilizing a heck of a lot of PCE, so that plume is dense. Thank goodness I thought about this early on. So he was able to do his simulations with density, and what you see next is you start to see density plunging of the solubilized PCE. You can see it's cleaning up the PCE in the, um, in the aquifer, and it's, it's, it's persisting in some lower permeability zones. And uh, this, this shows you that after about 14 days, we really do see a dramatic density plunging. Now, this is a model. We capture it in our model. But in reality, we could lose the plume. It could be a, a serious concern. So we'd have to be careful in designing our pumping rates so that we would, we would know what would happen. Um, after, uh, oh, I'd say about 30 days, the napple is gone, and we have some stuff that's solubilized and is still left. But uh, do you believe it, 30 days? I don't believe it, but I like to show this to regulators when we want to get money. Um, we say, in 30 days, we can clean up with surfactant, and it would take 1,300 with pump and treat. Now, I don't believe either of those numbers, but I do believe the relation between them. I believe that the solubilization with surfactant is going to be tremendously more efficient than pump and treat, but I don't believe the absolute magnitude. Um, now, the neat thing about this, this approach is that Tim did many, many realizations, and he tried to get a handle on the average behavior that we might expect and what properties influenced it. And I don't have time to talk about it in any great detail. I'll just show you one example. This is kind of an obvious one. The percent NAPL remaining versus the time as a function of the variance, the, the uh, degree of uh, heterogeneity in the formation. As you increase the heterogeneity, and again, we're dealing with relatively homogeneous sands here. As you increase the heterogeneity, the red curve indicates it takes longer to clean up the aquifer. That's not surprising. The other thing you notice is that the confidence interval, which is represented by those dotted lines, increases. Your certainty and your prediction decreases a lot as you increase the variability. And again, not surprising, but we can quantify this using Tim's approach. Now, Tim did about 25 realizations for every parameter we wanted to vary, and so after a while, he just hid from me because he didn't want me to have any more ideas. Uh, each of the simulations you see represented here, each of those realizations took about 12 to 24 hours on a, on a high-end workstation. So we're not at the level here that we're going to go out and use this as a tool in the field. It's just, we're not there yet. But we're trying to learn from using the simulation. So in summary then, SEER, that's our new acronym, Surfactant Enhanced Aquifer Remediation, appears to offer a promising alternative to traditional pump and treat. Um, heterogeneity is going to play a dominant role in the delivery of the surfactant, as it does in so many um, enhanced pump and treat applications. And there's just no way around it. Um, there's some ideas out there that, that others are looking at. Um, we still want to investigate a little more of the interplay between the local and the macroscopic.